Hello, thanks so much for joining again. So each Friday at three o'clock, I'm talking with a different musician or business person to talk about uh, their life and work. And today I'm joined by Robin Allegra Parton, soprano extraordinaire. Robin, thank you so much for, for diving in. I wonder, could you just tell us a bit about your training and, 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 and where you are now? Um, thank you for having me. I um, Yeah, so I studied in England. I studied uh, music at university in Oxford. And then I um, went to the Royal College of Music and did a master's there um, a very long time ago. And um, yeah, I've just been singing, singing ever since really. Um, I've done lots of different kinds of jobs within singing. And I'm currently in Germany in a fest contract, which means like a full-time contract in a house in Germany. Nice. It's scary, isn't it, how long uh, uh, Oxford and, and, and training feels. It feels like a very distant memory, which is um, quite horrific, really. But uh, do you think like, yeah. that, you know, that whole Oxbridge kind of choral tradition, do you think, uh, is it something that needs to be left to establish like a singing career? Or do you think there are useful like, elements of it for operatic training? Um, there are definitely useful skills to be found in the in that kind of training. I mean, um, just in general, musicianship skills like sight reading, um, saying yes to things. You know, the speed, the 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 way in which you come to rely on your own ability to get something done given a deadline. That's pretty powerful. Um, but of course, yeah, of course, the industry needs more diversity than than that. And I think it already does have it is already going in that direction. Um, certainly going to Oxford or Cambridge does not give you the skills, all of the skills that, that you need in, in order to have a career in opera. So, um, of course, there are other there are other pathways. And yeah, I'm looking forward to a world where more singers come from other avenues. I'm, I'm often... Um looking around and thinking like oh that person's made it in their career and they've done that and they've oh you know and like the the essence of making it as a singer do you think like um i mean what what does that really mean and and do you think as a with have you made it is what i'm trying to ask in a very roundabout way oh my god <laughs> um you know what i'm further ahead than i ever thought i would be so sure I'm happy to say that for my my own sake, and it obviously it has to, it can only be for me. Um, I'm very content with how far I've come. Like I make a I make a living from singing. Um, yeah, I get to be on the stage. That's that's all I ever really wanted, and I have it. Um, there are, you know, so many different levels of ambition within within a career, and I. I don't know what I started out with, but I'm definitely satisfied. Did you have, did you, sorry to interrupt, did you have setbacks along the way uh, while you were finding, you know, your time on the stage and how did you deal with those? Yeah, I mean, um, uh, the first one was, was um, after my master's, I didn't get into opera school and that felt like a big kind of um, like ceiling that just closed and I thought, okay, well, I've run out of ideas. I don't really know what else I'm supposed to do. Um, but in a way, I think that was a big blessing. I, it meant that I took much more responsibility for uh, working out what the career is, what, um, how, you can, how you can progress, like what, what kind of different positions you can be in, in in terms of earning money from singing. But also it made me... Um, look inwards and evaluate what it was that I was missing uh, to in order to kind of receive that that message um, and that sent me off on this path of really believing in like a growth mindset where you where you where you feel like the sky is the limit in the sense that if you can learn how to do something you can you can probably achieve what you want there's a lot to be said for, for mindset isn't there in, in 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 approach and I know it doesn't really compare but when I'm I'm working with kind of a little group of, of volunteer singers, the, the more I can say to them, look, if you really believe that you know this music and you have the confidence to actually deliver it and sing it well, like it will come across that you know it. As soon as they start going, <laughs> I've got no idea how this piece goes, it's impossible. Well, it's gonna naturally fall apart, isn't it? And I, I guess, 
does one need to be a confident person to to like uh, be a, a good singer or is it something that you can sort of learn over the over that's the years? a really good question i think um of course you need you need the confidence to present yourself in front of a room full of people and their eyes especially when the eyes are on you it's very alarming um so yes you definitely need confidence for that but i think um it's for sure something that you can train you can get better at it and you could and you might lack confidence in a very specific area only in under certain conditions and i think one of the most important things to learn as an individual is which, which conditions do i need to be uh, in control of which ones am i in control of what can i guarantee going in a direction that that um helps me on a day for example say you have an audition and you need to say you learn about yourself that what you need in order to give yourself the headspace to focus enough is to prepare your clothes the day before you might prepare your meals you travel early enough um, you might set up a singing lesson in a couple of days beforehand those kinds of things you learn them about yourself and um, I think that definitely that kind of um, way of operating definitely gives me confidence um, yeah. This is the stuff that I feel singers and musicians generally never really talk about that much. The kind of behind the scenes, it's all very like, it looks very glamorous, doesn't it? Like, oh, I'll turn up at the airport, I'm going to fly to somewhere and perform on this stage. But actually, it's more like, oh, I better make myself a sandwich so that I can, um, you know, actually have enough food and, and all of that. And uh, I think, yeah, people don't really consider all those. I think that's that. I've done 33 podcasts now and I think that's some of the best advice that I've heard, like the practical, um, <laughs> like day-to-day -day stuff. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so say like a, a singer is graduating or they're, they're coming, uh, applying for, I don't quite know how it works, but applying for opera contracts. Is there, I think you've given some already, but are there specific bits of advice that, that you would give them about how they audition or, or how they prepare for audition? Yeah. Okay. Preparing for auditions is, um, it's tricky because going back to thinking about what's under your control and what isn't, auditions are a very out of control experience. Probably the most out of control that we are in the entire job. It's a big part of the job. Um, you're just not, you, you cannot take any, um, well, responsibility for what a panel decides based on what you offer. So all you can do is is focus on what you offer. And that means hopefully doing something that gets towards your best. So maybe something realistic like 80% of your best, best singing, best acting, best presentation in general. Um, and then I think it's about doing as many auditions as you possibly can because it's also a numbers game. There will be, there will be so many reasons why you don't get a job that are nothing to do with how you performed. And I remember when I started out, I did so many auditions, and I remember sort of going through it and counting like how many, how many are successful in the sense that something came from it. Um, and actually, it was just about numbers. The more you do, the more likely you are to get to 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 get going, starting off a kind of network of work, and hopefully you then get reinvited back by those people to to perform with them again, and that's you know you meet new people along the way. Uh, that wasn't very clear. I would say do as many auditions as you can, and treat it treat each one as if as if it's a privilege. Um, as, <laughs> oh yeah, somebody told me once. Um, imagine that you're doing a concert, so it's it's actually the panel's privilege to get to listen to you. I mean, that's quite difficult to really maintain that belief when you're in the moment. But in many ways, it is a privilege to be given time to sing to people. I I imagine some of them are quite like, right, you're in the door, you've got 10 minutes, what are you going to sing? It's high stress, like, it's it's not a good operating environment, is it really, to, to give of one's best, like the natural audition? Um, performing is usually quite stressful anyway. I'd say it's not a dissimilar environment. Um, so I think it depends on how you react to that, whether you do get stressed by it or not. Um, if you're lucky and you don't, then that's great. 
And if you do, then again, like before, I think it's about about taking measures to reducing the stress as far as you can. So being prepared. I mean, that is always key is preparation. I personally feel much more nervous when I am less prepared. Um, I do a lot of uh, obviously musical preparation, but also acting preparation. And I know I have noticed along the year, you know, over the years that the less acting preparation I do, the more nervous I feel. So that is something that I've changed. Have you got any tips for like, say you've, you've got a score uh, and, and you've got to get it in here somehow and ready for performance. Have you got any strategies for, for learning a, a role? For memorising? Uh, yeah, memorising or, or just, yeah, yeah, memorising, I guess. Yeah, yeah I think that's... It, people differ. We, have, we all have different types of memory, I think, um, or processes of, of memorising. And I personally, I come from a, a piano playing background, lots of score reading and sight reading. So I've got none of the, the oral training, the ear, you know, I don't have amazing ears for picking up stuff like that. So what I do is I look at the page, I kind of photograph it in my mind. And then... Um, I usually write things out over and over. So I'll write out the words. Um, I might even write down the names of the notes, like alongside the words. And then I just test myself one phrase at a time. Um, using Also using recordings online, you know, to make sure that you're not suddenly disturbed by an orchestra that does something, di- or a conductor who does something slightly different with the timing or whatever. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's how I do it. Um, recordings can be like a, a blessing and a curse, can't they? Because if you learn something st- uh, specifically from a recording, say you haven't got your level of like score reading or, or whatever, then you can pick up on like eccentricities, I guess, in a performance. You, maybe one needs to be a bit careful with that as well. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think I never use recordings in in the way of um, like musical interpretation. I might I might listen to you know old classic masters of stuff in order to see what's regularly done with something but I I think the I'm not really listening to the music in that sense um but yeah you're right if 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 there's some like rubato in something that isn't written in the score I guess you do have to have to just note that to yourself that actually that might not happen in, in practice so kind of looking back on 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 your career so far have you got any kind of like highlight moments where you you were just like yes that was that was a really that was a, a you know I did a good job there that that was important to me um loads <laughs> <laughs> I really really love singing and I think uh yeah there's one that immediately like jumps out in my mind which was um last year just in a concert doing a, a gala concert and there was this aria um from Lucia di Lammermoor and I had done it loads of times um and I think maybe that's key maybe being so prepared for something that you can really experiment in the moment and um really get I just got into that flow state you know where where everything turns slightly magical and I remember thinking in that moment oh this is just such a a joy um but in terms of actual achievements and things I suppose um something I was very proud of was I I jumped in at last minute in uh Sweden in Stockholm at Folkopan to sing Coraline this um, modern piece by uh, Mark Antony Turnage and they were performing it in Swedish but their singer was sick so I jumped in for that and um I think I had about well I don't remember how long I had to learn it in Swedish but it was not very long and that um, I was really proud of because the they were all really pleased and the press were really nice and favourable and um, they had a a, uh, a prize that they gave me afterwards to say thanks for doing it in Swedish basically. <laughs> I don't know, that, just, that just felt very that felt very uh, meaningful. That that does sound like an, an accomplishment in a, in a maybe an, an unfamiliar language jumping in at very short notice, kind of all the things coming together. Um, yeah. Just going back to something you, you mentioned earlier, you were talking about the idea of the, 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 the eyes on you, the audience's eyes uh, upon you. And like, I wonder if you have any 
strategies for 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 kind of you know you're walking onto the stage or whatever and those fi- those feelings of nerves that one can associate with performance um i wonder if you've got any ideas for kind of maybe uh singers you know who, who, who don't have the experience like to deal with those nerves yeah um my first suggestion would be get a therapist or a performance um, performance psychotherapist because I think, you know, I have no idea what goes through other people's minds when they're nervous. I only know my mind. <laughs> mm. um, and I guess the more experience you have, the more you can um, judge what it is that's re- that you're really thinking about in those moments. Um, I think therapy in general is, is a good a good thing to get to a level where you can articulate your own emotions well enough to know what you need in moments of extreme pressure. You know, when you enter that fight, flight or freeze situation, yeah. you want to be able to react to to any particular problems. For example, I always get um, an internal monologue in those moments and I'm just, I have to shut it up because otherwise I'll go wrong or I'll forget or I'll, or I won't be really in the moment. I won't really be, um, staying in character so my training has been about um really how to focus the mind when you've got distractions going on so i literally did this this um kind of focus training exercise that's for people who suffer from um adhd Mm. so it's about training uh training the brain to be able to isolate one thought at the at the same time as others anyway so that's probably divulging too much but um, no I, yeah. I i think that that i am I'm, I'm, sh- I'm sure there are many there are many people who are in the position where they wouldn't necessarily you know admit to you know because therapy is such a I don't know, it's a, a stigma, isn't it? It has a stigma attached to it. Or, or I'm not quite perfect in my career or I must be doing something wrong. But actually, it's something that I'm sure is, yeah. Um, I, think, it's, it's, I think it's interesting that you use the word perfect because perfectionism is, is definitely one of the biggest um, uh, casualties, I suppose, of our training. You know, we're so disciplined and we do years and years, decades of training. Yeah. And... Um, my in my experience we're often told things are right or wrong when actually yes. they could be slightly more gray than than black and white um and i think i'd say i've spent most of my the last 10 years trying to recover from that um yeah. getting away from it and it, and and that brings all sorts of other other it brings other problems with it for example you know looking sideways looking at other people judging yourself in comparison and yeah I mean, that, that, that leads you exactly onto that point. And one is guilty of, of like, you know, uh, I did it this morning. I was just scrolling through Facebook thinking, oh, that's such and such. Look at that. What a gig. You know, they're doing this, whatever, the proms or that. They've got that booking. And it, it's just impossible, really, to function and to focus in your own space where, where you are constantly exposed to all the successes of other people around you. Mm-hmm. um so i guess yeah we such good advice for for kind of singers and um in in their in their careers i've i've got a a, a a final section which says um fun final questions um <laughs> yeah, i mean it couldn't be any more fun really how i phrase it but anyway uh, aside from singing what else do you get up to i hate questions like that i mean it's just oh. like i live my life you know i, I eat dinner I, come on you know have you got any oh, weird no, hobbies this. though I love those questions. Um, All right. <laughs> someone once accused me of having a lot of hobbies, and I thought, is that, a, is that really a bad thing? Um, so I, uh, okay, this is going to out me as a massive nerd. Um, I go to an astronomy club, and I go to a philosophy class online. Um, poetry clubs, book groups, you know, wow. that kind of stuff. That's how do you fit all that in? That's really uh, that's impressive. Yeah, it's kind of tough. Like sometimes, I mean, I mean, a lot of the time you might have a six week period where you think, okay, I can't fit it in. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to be around for that month. But the month after, I I should have Tuesday evenings free or something like that, you know, or Sundays. Sundays are always a good day. Um, and then other than that, sports. Try and keep fit and actually sports. Favorite sport. Sorry. Uh, have you got a favourite sport or like or, exercise? Or uh, I used to play a lot of football, and I'm not very good. Everyone always thinks whenever women say that they play football, think that they're really good, and I'm really not very good. But I 
enjoyed it and I was very enthusiastic. Um, and now I run and I just got a bike because I've moved to a, a city that is a bike city. Um, so it's the first bike that I've had since Oxford. I'm very happy to be cycling around the city. Um, I had three yeah. bikes stolen at Oxford. Oh, three, all parked I'm sorry. outside. <laughs> I think one, um, I tried to buy one, I think it was the original, the original gum tree or something, I can't remember what it mm. was, but it turned up in the back of a white van and they, <laughs> they sold me the lock with the bike. Oh, no. uh, so I obviously, you know, should have learned, maybe don't buy the lock from the person who's selling you the bike because yeah. they'll obviously then be able to open the bike and take it back and then sell yeah. it to somebody else. You'd think you'd live and learn. Um, You're I was actually ta- part of a crime ring. Yeah. I'm part of a crime ring. <laughs> Um, I was talking to our, our good friend Max Hearn, who I, I'm sure you remember back from Oxford days. And our, um, Robin and, and I and uh, did a, a <laughs> I mean, it's slightly horrendous, but a performance of Figaro back in the day in the in the Sheldonia. It feels like such a distant memory. But I just wanted to get it on the record. Uh, sorry, I was a very inexperienced conductor back then. I still am, and I was probably terribly offensive. And um, not think, at all. That was like the high. That was, I think, the highlight of my operatic conducting career. Figaro in the Sheldonian Theatre in two thousand and eight, nine. Can't remember. Anyway, nine. I yeah. loved that performance. I had the best really? time. I really, really loved it. That was one of my favourite experiences. So. I've been thinking yeah. all these years that maybe you thought, oh, God, Ben, honestly. But this is where it goes for the internal monologue, doesn't it? <laughs> of course not. <laughs> no, I only have really fond memories of that. I really enjoyed it. Um, and how fantastic to be able to do something like that. I mean, that's... Yeah. 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 Pretty rare to have those opportunities as an as a, a undergraduate. Or, or, yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah, I wish everybody could have that. It's, um, yeah, that is a, a shame about the status of... Um, training in the UK that that those opportunities are hard to come by. Yeah. yeah. Look, um, you've heard enough from us, enough reminiscing. As ever, if you've enjoyed the the, the, the talk, you can like, subscribe, and the Patreon is just below, patreon.com forward slash Knightsbridge. Robin, Allegra, pardon, thank you very much. (laughs) Thank you very much.